Please welcome Dr. George Weigel, who will now speak to us on the topic, Renewing the Church. Thank you very much, uh, Father Vincent. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me begin with a story about Pope John Paul II. In the 1990s, perhaps the early 1990s, uh, the Pope understood that a distinguished Polish actor named Jerzy Stor was in Rome. So he invited him to the papal apartment for dinner. After saying his usual rapid-fire Latin grace, uh, Mr. Storr sits down across from the Pope, who says to him, So, Panierzy, tell me, what brings you to Rome? Mr. Storr says, Holy Father, I'm playing in Forefather's Eve. Forefather's Eve is the most important play in the history of Polish drama. It's such a powerful evocation of the Polish national spirit that it's public production was banned in the partitioned Poland of the 19th century. So the Pope says, ah, Forefathers Eve, Adam Mickiewicz uh, talks at some length about the importance of the play, Pope recites large chunks of the play by memory, uh, as he had once played in it himself, and then says to his guest, tell me, Panierzy, what role do you take? And Jerzy Stor looks across the table at the Pope with a bit of chagrin, and says, Your Holiness, I regret to report that I am Satan, <laughs> who is in fact a character in the play. And the Pope thinks about that for a minute and says, Well, none of us gets to choose our roles, do we? <laughs> uh, I did not uh, choose the role, nor I, do I pretend to be gifted for the role of being a great expert on the situation of the church in Ireland. But I want to thank David Quinn and the Iona Institute for inviting me to be here with you tonight, and I want to thank all of you for coming at this very busy season to take some time to think together about the future of the faith in Ireland, which is so important to the future of the faith throughout the world. Every day at Mass, the Church prays sorsum corda, lift up your hearts. Interestingly enough, to go back to Polish literature again for the second and last time this evening, <laughs> sorsum corda was the motto adopted by the Polish Nobel laureate Henry Sienkiewicz for his novels, which were written during that 19th century period when Poland, like Ireland, uh, was denied its independence. And Sienkiewicz's novels, like Mickiewicz's plays, kept alive the idea of Poland so that that country, like your own, could have a new birth of freedom in the aftermath of the First World War. And tonight I want to speak to you in both senses of sorsum corda. Uh, in the first and deepest, deeper sense, uh, I would like to suggest tonight that we put all of our hopes and fears, our angers and aspirations for the future of the Catholic faith in Ireland uh, before the Lord, uh, because any renewal of the Church will begin with a renewal of faith, and faith is a gift of God. Second, I want to use our time together to consider how this country can be reborn in faith, as the Poland Henry Sienkiewicz wrote for uh, his fellow Poles was reborn after what Poles call their Calvary, 123 years when this historic nation uh, was erased from the map of Europe by the three great powers of the neighborhood, Russia, Prussia, and Austria. And I need not tell all of you that Ireland has been living an experience of Calvary 
in recent years. Abusive clergy preying on innocents. Irresponsible bishops who betrayed their commissions as shepherds. I could add to that an aggressive and hostile media and aggressive politicians. We could add them to this portrait of this Irish via crucis, this Irish way of the cross. But let's leave all that aside tonight and focus on life within the family of the church. And if I have any authority to speak to you uh, on these matters tonight, uh, any credit among you, let uh, this be it, that I too lived something like your Calvary during what we in America called the Long Lent of 2002. And during that time I learned amidst anger and tears that uh, the crisis of abusive clergy uh, and religious and the crisis of irresponsible leadership from bishops is at bottom a crisis of fidelity. It's a crisis of fidelity. Priests who truly believe that they are what the Catholic Church teaches they are, namely icons of the eternal priesthood of Jesus Christ, do not abuse anyone, much less innocent young people. Bishops who truly live the truth of what the Catholic Church says they are, shepherds in the image of the Good Shepherd, do not let the little ones of the Master's flock fall into the hands of predators. A crisis of fidelity. And the response to it must be a deepening of fidelity, a radical renewal of Catholic faith. That's the only way that crisis can be turned into opportunity. As many of you know, the Greek word kairos can mean crisis in our ordinary sense of the term, a big mess where everything is going wrong. But a kairos can also be a moment of opportunity. We pass from kairos as crisis to kairos as opportunity through the purification of a radical uh, renewal of faith. That understanding, I think, leads us by a very short path to a consideration of true and false reform in the church. It often seemed in America in 2002, and perhaps it seems to some of you here today uh, in Ireland, that this crisis uh, is to be understood something uh, by, some, uh, by something of an analogy to what happens when a police department becomes corrupted. We all know from novels and uh, movies and perhaps even some real police history that at a certain point uh, a tipping point can be reached in a police department where there is no quick fix possible you simply have to uh, remove large numbers of people and start again. That analogy seemed to me to have some <coughs> salience in America in 2002. I leave it up to you to judge whether it has any salience here in Ireland in 2011. But in any event, uh, however minimally attractive or immediately attractive that analogy might be, we have to go deeper. For even after immediate problems have been addressed and new leadership is appointed, we are still left with the problem, the challenge of the deepening of Catholic faith. And here we have to understand that all true reform in the church is a matter of reform. Put a dash, if you will, between the two syllables of that word. All true Catholic reform is reform. And what is the form here? The form here is the constitution or basic structure 
given to the church by Christ himself. During the height of the U.S. mess of 2002, uh, a good-willed but not terribly theologically a sophisticated a religious sister wrote an op-ed column in which the bottom line was, it's our church and we're going to take it back. And I responded at the time in this book, The Courage to be Catholic, no, actually, it's Christ's church. And when we start thinking it's our church, we're on the road to serious trouble. St. Paul took 16 chapters explaining to the Romans why this is Christ's church and not uh, our church. And when I say that Christ gave the church a constitution, I obviously do not mean a written constitution uh, like yours or ours. I mean a constitution in, if you will pardon me, the British uh, sense of the term, uh, an essential form to the structure of the body. For example, that the church is to be governed by bishops who are in communion with the Bishop of Rome is of the will of Christ for the church. The long-held view in the Latin church, the Latin Rite Church, that celibacy in the higher grades of holy orders, the priesthood, and the episcopate is of the will of Christ is part of the constitution of the church. The authoritative teaching that the church can only call men to holy orders because, because priesthood in the Catholic Church is not a set of functions, but rather an identity, a matter of the iconography of the eternal priesthood of Christ and Christ's spousal gift of himself to the church. This, too, is of the will of Christ or the Constitution of the church. So, proposals for Catholic reform that essentially involve turning Catholicism into another liberal Protestant denomination are not authentic Catholic reform. However well intended, they miss two key points. First, liberal Protestant denominations have the same problems that have rocked the church in the United States and Ireland. Secondly, you can't reform the Catholic Church by turning away from the form given to it by Christ. This was the great mistake, of course, at the time of the Reformation, a time when the church was deeply in need of reform in the authentic sense. So, True reform of the Catholic Church at one level uh, means uh, the identification and appointment of bishops who live the life of the Good Shepherd, the training and functioning of priests who live the truth of the Catholic priest as an altar Christus, as another Christ, as someone who makes present in his own gift of self to the church, Christ's spousal gift of himself to his bride, the church, as outlined by, by St. Paul in the letter to the Ephesians. But even that doesn't go deep enough, it seems to me. For all of us are called to the task of authentic Catholic reform. Authentic Catholic reform is not a task for those in holy orders only. It's not a task for those in the consecrated life of vowed poverty, chastity, and obedience only. It's a task for everyone in the church. Every baptized Catholic, particularly in these situations in which we find ourselves, is called to be an agent of authentic Catholic reform by being a man or woman of holiness uh, and of evangelical zeal. And I would now like to try to locate that challenge in a wider historical context. One of the great difficulties of talking intelligently about our problems uh, these days 
is that they are almost automatically pigeonholed into these tired old categories of liberal Catholics, conservative Catholics, progressive Catholics, orthodox Catholics, left, right, whatever. Everybody calls for reform in the church and then the argument breaks down. What the tablet means by reform is not what the wanderer means by reform. What some associations of clergy mean by reform uh, is not what the bishops mean by reform, and so forth and so on. Let me suggest tonight that one way out of this box, which is a real impediment to the authentic reform of the church, for the church is not, as I said to uh, a very fine uh, journalist, Sarah MacDonald, who's around here somewhere, I think, uh, earlier this afternoon, uh, the church is not a matter of left and right, the church is a matter of true and false. I think we get out of this box by widening the historical lens dramatically and developing a new way of looking at modern Catholic history, which means a new way of looking at today and a new way of looking at our possibilities. And in this wider lens, the authentic and radical reform of the Catholic Church has in fact been underway since 1878. Then the cardinals of the church elected uh, an Italian minor noble named uh, Gioacchino Pecci as the Bishop of Rome, succeeding Pius IX who had reigned for some 34 years. Pecci was 68 years old at the time of his election, they thought they were electing a placeholder. Uh, he lived another 25 years. Uh, indeed, famously in his 90th year, when an American bishop went to see him on an ad limina visit uh, and got misty-eyed at the end and said, Your Holiness, I expect this will be the last time the two of us see each other on this earth. The 90-year-old Leo XIII leaned over and patted the bishop on the arm and said, my dear man, you didn't tell me you were feeling poorly. <laughs> the true story of modern Catholicism begins with Leo XIII, who begins in a slow, steady way, over a quarter of a century, to engage the modern world, not to go into a bunker hiding from it, and launches uh, several programs of Catholic intellectual reform that have had a tremendous influence on the, sub on the subsequent history of the Church. It was Leo XIII who brought the Catholic Church into the world of modern biblical studies. It was Leo XIII who opened the archives of the Vatican to qualified historians, convinced as he was that the truth of history would serve the proclamation of the faith. It was Leo who invented, literally, the social doctrine of the church. This remarkable body of thought articulated in a series of encyclicals beginning with Rerum Novarum in 1891, uh, by which the Catholic Church has proposed a vision of the free and just society uh, that is as comprehensive and compelling as any on offer in the world today. And it was Leo XIII who, by mandating a, a renewal of the study of St. Thomas Aquinas, sought to renew Catholic philosophy and theology so that it could engage modern bodies of thought from within its own resources. This remarkable Leonine reform is in some sense uh, encapsulated in the Pope's tomb in the Basilica of St. John Lateran, the Papal Cathedral in Rome. I'm sure many of you have been there. You may not have noticed that the apse is flanked by two Papal tombs. On the right is Innocent III. On the left is Leo XIII. The tomb of Innocent III, possibly the most politically powerful pope uh, in history, uh, 
displays the Pope recumbent and asleep in a kind of classical funerary pose on top of the uh, marble casket. On the other side, here is Leo XIII, who has no political power, but who has invented a new form of Catholic power, namely the power of moral persuasion and uh, argument. And he's standing up. He's standing on top of the marble casket. And his right leg is thrust forward and his right hand is in the air as if he were making a proposal. That, that's the turning point to a church that is engaging modernity and whatever comes after modernity, not hiding in a bunker uh, from it. The Leonine reform was a controversial business uh, in the Catholic Church, as all reforming movements are. And yet, over the next uh, 30 years, 40 years after the death of Pope Leo XIII in 1903, that Leonine reform in biblical studies, historical studies, philosophical and theological studies, led to the great Catholic Renaissance of the mid-20th century here in Europe, in all of those fields, as well as in liturgy. Uh, the liturgical movement, which aimed once more to put the worship of the church at the center of the church's life uh, as the engine, if you will, uh, the reactor core of the church's engagement uh, with the world. And that mid-20th century Catholic flourishing led in its own turn to the Second Vatican Council. No Leo XIII, no mid-century Catholic uh, Renaissance, no Vatican II. Then we ran into a bit of trouble because the Second Vatican Council, the 21st such exercise in the history of the Church, was the first council never to provide keys for its own interpretation. If you want to know what the Council of Nicaea taught you read the creed that we recite on Sundays. If you want to know what the Council of Chalcedon taught about the relationship of the divine and the human in Christ, there is a dogmatic definition of the Council of Chalcedon. Other councils wrote canons into the law of the church, providing keys for that council's interpretation. Other um, uh, councils anathematized people uh, condemned heresies, and that's another kind of key to the uh, proper interpretation of the Council. Vatican II did none of that. It wrote no creed, it made no dogmatic statements, it wrote no canons into the law of the Church, it um, uh, did not condemn anyone or anything. It gave us 16 documents that the Church then received at a moment when the culture of the Western world was entering the white water of the late 60s. A very difficult time for a serene reception uh, of the teaching of the Second Vatican Council. Well, I would like to suggest to you tonight that these two extraordinary pontificates in which it has been our privilege to live for the past 30-some years, that of John Paul II and Benedict XVI, have provided the keys to the authentic interpretation of Vatican II. This is not inappropriate in that both of these men were formed intellectually and spiritually in that great mid-century Catholic Renaissance of which I spoke a moment ago. They both played significant roles at the Second Vatican Council. Wojtyla as a bishop, Ratzinger as a theological advisor or paritas. And now, between 1978 and 2011, they have, through their papal magisterium, systematically gone through all of the great themes of the Second Vatican Council and said, this is how these are to be read in light of the authentic intention of the Council itself. John Paul II, for example, made great use of the Synod of Bishops uh, in doing this. The Synod would meet to talk about priesthood, consecrated life, lay mission in the world, etc. 
deliberate, talk, read the council documents. Pope would then write an apostolic exhortation, bringing all that discussion to a fine point of development. So we now have an authentic interpretation of, of Vatican II uh, as a council, as Pope Benedict insists, that is in dynamic continuity with the great tradition of the church. This is not a council of rupture, as if Catholic life starts in 1962. It's a council of continuity intended to give the church a new Pentecostal energy as we enter the third millennium of Christian history. This was a theme very dear to the heart and indeed uh, dear to the mind uh, of John Paul II. He saw the Second Vatican Council as a providentially inspired moment in which the church, after 2,000 years of history, would rediscover the Holy Spirit who would empower the church to go into the third millennium as a great evangelical force at work in the world. Now, if that portrait of 130 years of Catholic history uh, is true, then we have lived through a great historical arc of development that begins with Leo XIII and in some sense is ending with Benedict XVI. Because the one thing we know with absolute certainty about the successor to Pope Benedict, whether that successor be elected a year from now, two years from now, or ten years from now. We know with absolute certainty one thing about this man. He will not have attended the Second Vatican Council. Indeed, if Pope Benedict becomes another Leo XIII, uh, which is not impossible, uh, the next pope might not even have been born at the time of the Second Vatican Council. Now this is a bit shattering uh, for those of us of a certain age for whom the Council is the reference point uh, of our Catholic lives in terms of a great ecclesiastical drama. Uh, but that's ending. And then the question is, what's coming next? And here is the proposal I would like to put before you tonight which frames this challenge of giving the faith a new uh, birth uh, here in Ireland. What we are witnessing, in some cases rapidly, in some cases slowly, in all cases not without difficulty, is an end to the church of the Counter-Reformation and the emergence on the world scene of what I and others have come to call evangelical Catholicism. A Catholicism that takes its central imperative from the 1991 encyclical of John Paul II, Redem Torres Missio, the mission of the Redeemer, where the Pope teaches that the church does not have a mission, as if mission were one of ten things the church did. The church is a mission. The church is a mission. And everything and everyone in the church ought to be mission-driven. This is a theme to which the Pope returned at the end of the Great Jubilee of 2000, when in the apostolic letter, Novo Millennio in Aunte, entering the new millennium, the Pope wrote of a church that leaves the shallow waters of institutional maintenance and sails out, like the apostles, into the deep often roiled, sometimes stormy waters, of the late modern and postmodern world in order to do what? In order to do precisely what the Lord commanded Peter and the other apostles to do, to throw the nets out for a catch. The Council, the Jubilee year of 2000, two great moments of preparation for the birth of a Catholicism that puts mission at the center of its life and puts the laity at the center of the church's mission. As the Pope John Paul II taught in the 
Apostolic Exhortation, Christi Fidelis Laici, Christ's Faithful Lay People, there are aspects of the new evangelization, including the evangelization of culture, of politics, of the media, of the family, of business, of the professions, where only lay people can be the instruments of the gospel and must be the instruments uh, of the gospel. This, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, this is the deep reform of the church. The transition from this Catholicism of institutional maintenance, somewhat defensive, to a Catholicism of forthright and unapologetic evangelism in which the church goes forth into the world confidently and humbly proclaiming that the gospel remains the most compelling, humane, compassionate proposal for our own individual lives and for the ordering of human community on offer in the world today. And within that image of deep reform in the church, there are two criteria by which we should measure every proposal for reform. The first is what I call the criterion of truth, and it asks, is this proposal congruent with the truth of Catholic faith as revealed in the Bible and apostolic tradition? And the second criterion is the criterion of mission. Does this proposed reform advance the mission of the church as an evangelical movement in uh, history? This is a new way for all of us of a certain age to think about our Catholic faith. Most of you in this room, judging from a quick look around, uh, had a, an experience not dissimilar to mine. Uh, I grew up in Baltimore, Maryland, uh, in the last moment of intact Catholic, often ethnic, uh, urban culture in the history of the United States. The very air we breathed the distinctive language we use, the way we dressed in school, the calendar we observe, uh, every, the, the vocabulary. How, how many other Americans in 1958 were using a Latinate vocabulary uh, with uh, confidence? Uh, all of this was a way of transmitting the faith. Yes, I was blessed with uh, faithful and prayerful parents, uh, and indeed grandparents, uh, and yes, we all grew up at a different moment in history. That's the point. The culture was transmitting the faith. The, it was in the air you breathed. That is gone. That is gone. Postmodern world is sure of nothing. It certainly is not sure of the truth of Catholic faith. The transmission of the faith today has to be conscious. It has to be deliberate. What the present Pope, Benedict XVI, calls friendship with Jesus is not something that is simply going to happen to someone in the postmodern world of the West. We have to invite people into that, beginning in our own families, of course, but extending beyond that. We are now back in a missionary circumstance. I said uh, earlier today, can't quite remember where, uh, that I once saw a photograph of one of these evangelical mega-churches, uh, Pentecostalist mega-churches, uh, I think it was in Dallas, Texas. And like just about everything in Texas, this was big. A uh, huge place, 10,000 people on Sunday, and a huge parking lot because you got 10,000 big Texas cars coming into this thing. And there's a sign that's been made up to look like a traffic sign as everybody drives out the parking lot. And the sign says, you are entering mission territory. Now, it would not be a bad idea to put that sign outside every Catholic church in the world so that when our people leave church on Sunday, 
they know that they are entering mission territory. This is true in the United States, and it's true here. For the real challenge before this ancient church, which has given so much to the world church, is now to convert Ireland itself, to give Ireland a new baptism, as Ireland once brought the gift of faith and the grace of baptism to the ends of the earth. I was down in Australia uh, last uh, month, and I remember the great bronze statue of Archbishop Daniel Mannix that uh, lives, uh, that uh, is uh, outside the cathedral in Melbourne. And I remember the uh, monuments all over Sydney and Melbourne, and even in Brisbane, uh, to those Irish sisters who left home, never expecting to see Ireland again, to go literally to the ends of the earth to bring uh, the grace of baptism and to be vehicles for God's gift of faith. And in looking at those monuments and thinking about coming here, uh, I thought about another friend of mine, uh, the now retired Cardinal Francis Arenze of Nigeria. Uh, not baptized till he was 10 or 11 years old, uh, a man who went on to play a great role in the world church. Uh, for some uh, 50 uh, years, uh, who is a Christian because of Ireland and has no compunction about uh, telling you that. Uh, I, am, I am a Catholic because of those Irish uh, brothers and fathers to whom my pagan father uh, sent me uh, to school. We think of those people, especially those sisters and priests who sailed away from these shores, literally, to the ends of the earth, knowing that they would never see Ireland again. And we get some sense of what the title of that book, to which Father Twomey uh, referred, really means. Uh, that was the courage to be Catholic. That was the courage to be Catholic, to accept the Lord's challenge, that what we have been freely given, we must freely give away. And that, if I may suggest, as your friend and fellow Christian here tonight, uh, that is the courage that is needed now. Uh, not so much to go out to the ends of the earth, uh, but that is the courage uh, needed now here uh, at home to give uh, this country a new birth of Catholic faith. Mission requires holiness. Mission requires that each of us be the Catholics we were baptized to be, to be the saints that we were baptized to be. That's a big challenge. And yet sanctity is every Christian's spiritual and human destiny. Saints, after all, as C.S. Lewis writes, are simply men and women who can live comfortably with God forever. That's what each of us has to become if we're to fulfill the promise of our baptism, as well as our human destiny. I've often said that the single greatest line written about the astonishing pontificate of John Paul II uh, was not written by me, uh, despite 1,700 pages of lines. Uh, it was written on the, uh, in the first week of the Pope's uh, pontificate on October 22nd, 1978, by a French journalist named André Frossard. Frossard had grown up in the um, high cultural atheism of his Paris family, had found his way into the church, and when he heard that clarion call of the new pope on October 22nd, 1978, be not afraid, open the doors to Christ. Frassard sent a story back to his uh, Paris newspaper with the extraordinary sentence, this is not a pope from Poland, this is a pope from Galilee. 
That's our situation. We're all being called by the Lord to Galilee, and then in your case, having met him there through the sacraments, you are being called, every single one of you, uh, back into your homes, your families, your businesses, your professions, uh, in order to be those missionaries that Ireland uh, needs. Uh, for centuries, Ireland, assume, uh, Ireland answered that call by uh, going, it, sending its sons and daughters to the far reaches of the world. Today, Ireland answers the call with courage by rekindling the flame of faith so that it sets the Emerald Isle ablaze today. Godspeed on the journey. Thank you.